Welcome to the Birds and the Bees podcast. This is Braxton Dutson. That's the key. People aren't talking about it. Everybody needs to know that porn is not a documentary. It's not like if we don't talk to kids about sex and sexuality, they're not going to hear about it. They're just not going to hear about it from us. They have tons of questions. They just don't know how to ask them. All you have to do is be one chapter ahead. You don't have to know everything. Mm. Just one chapter ahead of wherever your child is. Hey everyone, this is Braxton Dutson again with Birds and Bees Podcast. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and certified sex therapist here in Salt Lake City, Utah. And this episode is going across the world as we have a lot of downloads across the nation. And I'm excited to bring it to you coming straight from Salt Lake City, Utah. Now, every episode of this podcast is meant to bring you information from the top professionals in relational and sexual health through the interviews that I give to you. And I'm excited to bring you this second edition from Birds and Bees podcast. Now, this is episode two, as we've been talking about erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, and delayed delayed ejaculation. So if you missed the first episode, go back, listen to it. Um, Know that we're going to be talking about the male, male factor sexual dysfunctions that we can diagnose through the DSM. And if you are worried that you're experiencing any of these symptoms... It's important that you go talk to a doctor. This episode is not meant to help you diagnose yourself. It is not a replacement for primary care and visiting your doctor um, or talking to a professional sex therapist um, or therapist. I'm really excited to bring this episode to you. Shannon Hickman gives us wonderful information on this topic, especially with how, how predominant a lot of men feel like they're experiencing this. So without further ado, let's hop to the episode. Again, thank you for listening on birdsandbeespodcast.com, iTunes, Stitcher, and uh, let us know what you all think by giving us a call at 385-449-1818. That helps us a lot with knowing where uh, what what information you guys want to hear. Let us know if you have a topic that you want to listen to um, or that you'd like us to, you'd like me to, to interview someone on. Um, I'd love to get your feedback. If you found this episode helpful, I encourage you to write a iTunes review that helps us get out to more and more people as well as share this with one person. You never know who you're going to help support in their journey of sexual health and relational health. But thank you so much for tuning in and we're going to get right into that interview. Hey, welcome back to the Birds and Bees podcast. I'm your host, Braxton Dutson, and I have with me Shannon Hickman. <laughs> I don't know why I had, I had Natasha run through my mind. Well, I was like, I'm with Shannon it. Hickman. <laughs> I can be Natasha. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> you two are awesome. But yes, no, you're Shannon Hickman, and you're here on Birds and Bees podcast, and I'm glad to have you back. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, right now we're going to end up going over, so we just barely talked about um, premature ejaculation, and I think I've said it so many times, I really just need to say P.E. whenever I'm saying it, because it is a long, and there's a lot of stuff in there. I know, they're all going to be. They um, are. We're going to them off. So get ready for this one, delayed ejaculation. That's what we're going to be talking about on this first segment, but we're also going to be covering erectile dysfunction. Um, the diagnosis of it ways that you can best work with it, as well as some of the the causations, as well as the correlations between having these sexual dysfunctions. And um, so to start out, I mean, you're all right if we just jump right into the uh, the definition of delayed ejaculation? Sure. Cool. Sure. All right. So delayed ejaculation, according to the DSM-5, which is essentially the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and that's the fifth edition. What it, uh, what it says in the fifth edition is um, DE is a sexual disorder in which a man is unable to ejaculate during sexual activity, um, specifically after 25 minutes to 30 minutes of continuous sexual stimulation. So essentially, if you're going at it for 25 to 30 minutes, you're wanting to achieve um, orgasm, wanting to achieve ejaculation, and you're unable to. Um, they also say this... Uh, what they note in there as well is that it's the least understood of the sexual dysfunctions. And they say there's a number of reasons why it, uh, why it can come about. And we're, we're going to cover some of those today, but just know that ultimately we really don't know too much about DE. No. And I think it said that of like three to 8% of the population uh, or prevalence, which is not very much at all. No, not um, very many at all. But we're wondering if that's because people don't 
necessarily talk about it quite as much because I feel like I've maybe seen it a little more than that in my office. I don't know if you have Braxton. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if it's it's super prevalent for, for people that come in for me, but uh, it is definitely <laughs> when we're working with people that want to increase their sexual satisfaction, we tend to see people that are not necessarily having sexual excitement the way they want to. Right, yeah. right. And it can be uh, also lifelong uh, and primary or acquired as well as like what we were talking about before. And I know some of these people won't listen to it, but with premature ejaculation, same thing with PE. Definitely. Um, so DE can be lifelong or acquired. Definitely. And I'm realizing that uh, because we've been talking for a little bit, I didn't even like introduce you. It was like, all right, I screw up your name, <laughs> and okay. here's Shannon Hickman, LCSW and certified sex therapist. <laughs> Tell us a little bit. I know that those who had just listened to the podcast before uh, know a little bit about you, but uh, brief intro. Uh, sure. Who you are. Yeah. So um, I uh, have a private practice in Murray, um, Utah, called Core Healing Counseling, and I I'm also a Gottman trained therapist as well as an ASEC certified sex therapist. I treat a lot of couples as well as individuals. Um, I'd say um, probably the majority of my practice is uh, with couples who come in for gap in desire or any type of um, sexuality related issue. Um, And uh, I uh, worked for years with people in the medical field and uh, just realized that this was a huge need um, for them as far as uh, doctors and physicians and providers being able and uh, open to discussing sex. And it wasn't something that was being done. So I think it kind of piqued my interest in it. And so I ended up a lot of times being kind of the person that people would start opening up to about sex, especially when I worked in, um, dialysis. I worked in a dialysis clinic and, um, it was kind of like, well, you have this chronic condition now. And so you probably just don't have a good sex life. We see that, um, with cancer patients and with all kinds of other, um, and it just ends right there. Yeah. And so doctors weren't really bringing it up. They weren't talking about it. So it piqued my interest and, uh, I, with another colleague, I know we talked about this in the last one, but Kristen Benyon and I went to Miami to one of the ASEC conferences and loved every minute of it. It was amazing. There were amazing (laughs) people there and uh, learned all kinds of fun stuff about sex and decided that uh, we wanted to pursue um, this uh, in Utah and uh, come back and be certified sex therapists. That's awesome. And we will get Kristen Binion on here. I've, How I got my I'm going to have her. Awesome. <laughs> I'm going to have her on here. I've, I've, oh I've, I've got like five topics. I'm like, which one do I even yeah. throw her way? It's going to be great. Pelvic pain. Pelvic pain. <laughs> Perfect. I'm going to do that one. Thank you for the recommendation. Yeah. So sure. be, stay tuned, everybody. <laughs> we got pelvic pain. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's keep going with the, with the DE, delayed ejaculation. Okay. Essentially, we talked about the... Uh, um, how it's diagnosed and everything like that, but I don't, we we don't know a, a ton about about that. But uh, tell me a little bit about what when you're working with someone that comes in and says, "Hey, I'm experiencing delayed ejaculation, or I'm I'm unable to orgasm when I want to." Help me out. What are some of the things that uh, that you start to rule out? Sure. So with the very first uh, thing, same as I do with PE. I um, find out if they've seen a urologist that specializes in sex in sexual health. I um, find out uh, if they've had their hormones tested because uh, this can be affected if testosterone is low or um, any other you know hormone imbalance is going on. Um, and then also uh, if they've um, what their masturbation patterns are. That's a big Mm -hmm. one that we talk about. Um, Alcohol use, drug use, what medications they're on, all of this can play a role. 
Um, and so we, I do an in-depth assessment as far as that goes Mm -hmm. and, um, also assess a lot of times guys that, uh, will experience delayed ejaculation if there's, uh, worry or anxiety about, um, pregnancy. I think that's a big one. Oh, if they're worried about getting their partner pregnant. Yep. Yep. And especially this can come up when couples are trying to conceive. And, um, then all of a sudden it's a discussion around, okay, what's going on? Cause now they've been using condoms and this can be how it's acquired, right? Mm -hmm. It's not lifelong. They've been using condoms or they've been using protection. There's been no problem. Everything's been fine. Now they go off birth control, um, or stop using condoms. And all of a sudden the guy has delayed ejaculation. And so that's something that, you know, you'd work on in therapy or talk about and kind of get to the bottom of. Wow. So, um, that has come up before. Um, and, uh, yeah. So in-depth assessment, ruling out anything medical for sure. Mm -hmm. Always, always number one. And, uh, are there, are there certain, uh, medical things that, uh, that, you know, come back quite frequently? Um, I mean, last one we were talking the hyperthyroidism, um, is there anything with the prostate or do you know much of what, uh, what could be an issue that they'd want to get tested? Testosterone. And I know is one that gets tested quite frequently. Yeah. Testosterone. And, uh, I think sometimes anything to do with like the endocrine system. Mm-hmm. So, um, and this can be with, uh, erectile dysfunction too, but, um, like diabetes, age, oh. right? Age can, can be an issue with this. Age meaning as we get older. Yes, sorry. As we get older, we just don't function as well. So mm-hmm. this can be a cause, right? Yeah, body's changing. Uh, of delayed ejaculation, yeah, exactly. Some of the uh, causes that might be um, biological or physiological are spinal cord injuries, multiple scler- sclerosis, uh, any pelvic region surgery, Severe oh. diabetes and medications that inhibit, um, uh, the basically inhibit any ejaculation. Oh, so those are all of the medical reasons that might, uh, be causing delayed ejaculation. Huh. Okay. So that, I mean, that's an important one. So go see your doctor, go see a urologist. Is that who you go to as a urologist yeah, to get all that tested? Or internist. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Even family doctor could probably help with some of this. I always, any type, anytime any man comes into my office and has any type of, um, sexual dysfunction, I always, my first go to is a urologist and not mm-hmm. just any urologist, a urologist that specializes in sexual health. Oh, to have it. They're going to understand it a lot better. Gotcha. Then maybe someone who, you know, deals with a lot more of like, like bladder cancer or something like that. Right. Or types of cancer. Man, I, I have to say, I didn't know there was a real, like that we had urologists that were specifically mm-hmm. that would specialize within urology, but that makes sense. I mean, yeah, shouldn't surprise me. However, it's important. <laughs> Yeah, and unfortunately in Utah, I don't know that we have a lot of sexual medicine specialists, but um, they're kind of always my go-to. Any physician with um, that specializes in sexual medicine is going to be able and up and have more knowledge on a lot of these sexual dysfunctions for men and women. Nice. So when it comes to, I mean, you said something um, a little bit earlier about uh, masturbation techniques. Uh, yes. in what way would that, uh, does that cause or correlate with, uh, delayed ejaculation, things along that? What, what do we end up seeing there? Sure. So a lot of times, um, and this is where, you know, I have clients get really, really specific in session about their masturbation patterns, because, um, if they started masturbating when they were 11, uh, with, I mean, there's all kinds of, this is probably going to sound really weird to our listeners, but maybe not because we're normalizing all of this, right? I was like, we've talked about some weird things on Birds of Bees podcast, and it's okay. (laughs) Well, and I don't want to shame anybody. (laughs) So people masturbate with all kinds of things, right? Uh So um, it might have been that they used a book to masturbate with um, because that's what they had in the house and it had 
medical, uh, you know, but pictures in it, right? Uh-huh. There's 12, 13. Um, it can be like a washcloth or a hand towel um, and it, all kinds of different objects that are very hard to replicate, right? Mm-hmm. This when they actually have a sexual experience um, with a partner. So they create a different, so, a different sensation. Oh yeah. And, uh, speed, friction, uh, you know, um, pressure, mm-hmm. all of it, all of it makes a difference. So a lot of times it's, uh, figuring that out, you know, trying to figure out if that's an issue and then retraining, oh, retraining okay. them, um, so that they can have, um, basically to focus more of their sexual energy on their partner and to um, kind of to be more present. Yeah. Well, and to sometimes just not, um, not masturbate maybe as often. Gotcha. And this isn't to say that if you do masturbate and, or if you did masturbate with a book or say, if we've got, an 18 year old that isn't sexually active right now listening like, Oh no, I did use right. washcloths. No, it's fine. You're going to be, <laughs> it doesn't you're... mean you're going to have delayed ejaculation. <laughs> <laughs> nope. It is not. That's not the, the causation. Cause even for, if we're going into facts, you know, a, a vaginal opening or, um, or anal sex, vaginal sex, oral sex does not have even the same type of grip that uh, a male can have when he's masturbating, even with just his hand. Yeah, um, exactly. the tightness of the grip, everything along those lines, it can be very hard to replicate and with a hand, even impossible to replicate with a vaginal, um, with the, the pelvic floor muscles. And so it's right. a different experience all around. And you're the, the retraining, I'm, I'm interested in what you mean by retraining. How do you go about retraining from a masturbatory experience to a partnered sexual encounter? Sure. And I was just going to touch on what you're saying and it's very different, right? It's very individual for every person, men and women. Mm -hmm. Um, so retraining. So this would be where, um, you could use like a flashlight, like we talked about Uh before, um, practicing with less, um, speed, less pressure, um, maybe, uh, different kind of arousal or stimulation, um, all kinds of things. But, but I find it's more helpful if you're kind of simulating more of what a vagina, right. Would feel like Uh if that's the issue, if it's a cisgender couple. So being able to replicate what you're, what you're wanting to experience. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Exactly. And then, um, that is one thing, not masturbating, um, sometimes I've told clients just to stop masturbating and focus all their sex, a hundred percent of their sexual energy on their partner uh-huh. to see if that helps make a difference. Definitely. And then that may even pull out if you're, um, no pun intended, <laughs> but that you're may, right. even, I'm like, why am I saying, why am I saying that? Sometimes the things that I, the words I use are definitely very different in different sexual connotations <laughs> that might elicit or bring up not pull out, but bring up, um, different anxieties that come up, um, because masturbation and, uh, you know, porn use or, um, any, uh, specifically masturbation can end up being a coping mechanism that, uh, that anyone can use, or specifically as we're talking about men, that men are using to, to deal with distress at work and relationships and, um, in any part of their life. And so if that becomes a difficult thing to say, okay, I, I have to stop masturbating and I can't not stop. Um, what's going on in life? I mean, you can kind of get farther down into that as well. Yeah. And I think, um, that's where you have to be really careful and this has to be really individualized and why we have to do such an in-depth assessment because that may not be the issue at all. Masturbation may not be a concern at all and Mm -hmm. may not be what's causing the delayed ejaculation. So I think just even for listeners out there, like you said earlier, you know, we don't want to like alarm anybody or worry anybody that the way they're masturbating is going to create an issue. <laughs> uh, but it's something to be aware of um, if there is an issue that there's things that we can do to help people kind of um, 
just retrain their bodies. Yeah. The bodies have memory, right? To be able to retrain the body. So do you have any recommendation? Oh, no, we, I even talked about that, but being able to replicate, being able to replicate yeah. that. So flashlight, a sleeve, um, maybe uh, doing it first dry if you use something else, right? Uh-huh. And then adding a lube in, um, yeah. something like that. Gotcha. Can be really helpful. So when it comes to, I mean, some of the things that it, uh, that I heard um, or that I was reading on as well is that having, um, like, if you're experiencing delayed ejaculation, it's because you're older or because you're not 100% sure, but it is what your experience is, and you'd like to start building a family. Um, some of the things I was hearing is that masturbating up until the point of no return and then um, having vaginal penetration or getting up to that point to where you are able to ejaculate inside of your partner. Mm-hmm. And I've had clients do that and they've found it to be helpful sometimes. Mm-hmm. So there is, I yeah. mean, you can have, and even going back, I, I encourage anyone to go back and listen to the previous episode where we really talk about what, what, what are you experiencing? Is, are we making this all about, um, the ejaculation? Are we all making this about orgasm or what are you wanting to experience? Pleasure? How is your partner experiencing pleasure? Um, this seems like this is very relevant to this diagnosis as well. Definitely. Definitely. So really trying to help people get out of the performance model, uh, help them to see that sex doesn't have to look a specific way, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that it doesn't have to end, um, in this specific orgasm. And I think, a lot of times, one thing, too, to be aware of is that the men sometimes have no problem masturbating and with ejaculation. It's once they start with a partner, right, that mm-hmm. they're having the issue. Um, and so uh, mindful te- mindfulness techniques, which we talked about in the last um, podcast, but uh, really being present, being aware of your body. Um, sometimes, uh, guys with OCD or ADD aren't able to focus, right? Mm -hmm. So are there distractions going on? We've got to assess, um, if there's any mental health issues, depression, um, all kinds of stuff can lead to that. So we have to address and, and treat any of that stuff that that's going on too. Definitely. And, uh, with partners, I mean, speaking to partners, um, I think it can be quite easy for someone to feel like they're not enough for their partner if they're not, if again, if we're focused on the, the orgasm model versus the pleasure model that we talked about in the last episode. Um, do you see partners experiencing that a lot where it's like, do you, are you not attracted to me or you can masturbate and like you can do it, but I can't and feeling failure. Does that, do you see that happen? Yeah, definitely. And I think it gets frustrating for partners because, um, it, it, they don't want it to last that long all the time. Right. Uh-huh. And so if we're all goal oriented and it has to be you ending in ejaculation or we haven't had a successful experience, then typically both um, partners feel like they failed. They mm-hmm. feel like sex didn't go well. Yeah. So um, definitely just focusing more on pleasure, being mindful focusing on other ways of having sex and enjoying and realizing that it doesn't necessarily have to end in ejaculation or it doesn't have to look the way kind of we typically in quotes, you know, think it Mm -hmm. needs to work. Yeah, most definitely. And one of the things as I was reading, there was a, uh, um, I believe it was a Stephanie Bueller's book, um, but I can't remember for the, I could, it might even have been the, the guide to getting it on, but they were talking about exploring fantasies. One of the therapists was talking about how she um, experiences, or she has a partner that uh, experiences delayed ejaculation and um, they've been able to have kids and they've, you know, they feel some frustration in certain parts, but they've been able to work around it in the sense of exploring fantasies. Um, and that's been able to help, you know, with different fantasies, different scenarios, um, but getting really, um, 
re- again, communicating with each other about what they want and what they want to experience. And then she says that at times it's, it really starts to get to a point where they are having sex, they're enjoying, they're getting to a place, and then they've got a sign for it's like, hey, I, I think I'm good with the pleasure we've experienced. And both of them are like, sweet, good job, you know, high five and... Um, yep. You know, they don't feel bad. They don't feel shame. It's fine. Yeah. And that, the, I think what she was talking about too, is like, she doesn't end up in orgasm either. Where it was just yeah. like, we are having a good time together. We're experiencing this. This feels good. And that's the important part of this. Um, because she's like, I don't orgasm from penetration alone. And I need to have clitoral stimulation, which is essentially 75% of the population anyways. Mm -hmm. And so they've had to have a lot of conversations about that. And I thought that was fascinating um, and important to talk about. Yeah. Well, and I think you just touched on something really important too, that these guys typically have no problems with erections, right? Mm -hmm. They they are able to get an erection and keep an erection and it's a good erection for a long amount of time. Mm -hmm. But he is because of that reason, um, are they going into these sexual experiences with enough arousal, right? Mm -hmm. Are they actually aroused and feeling it? So that's where the mindfulness stuff comes in and fantasy and desire. Um, Are they experiencing enough um, of all of that in order to actually have like ejaculation and a really um, positive sexual experience rather than just, oh, I have an erection. Okay, let's go. Yeah. And definitely, even as as you were talking about earlier, too. As they get older, they need that, too. Yeah. Different arousal, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And some of the questions you might ask yourself, too, is like, what if the problem disappears? What if if the uh, delayed ejaculation was gone? Are there any fears that come up? Is there fear of, like you said, pregnancy? Is there fear of... You know, what what that looks like? Would sex want to happen more often? I mean, there's there's a lot of of different things that can come up... um, when, when looking at uh, delayed orgasm. Yeah. And so one of the ways in which might be helpful is, you know, really like tapping into that fantasy and um, bringing some of that into the bedroom uh, if both partners are comfortable mm-hmm. and really being very aroused, right? Making sure that you're really aroused before you're going into yeah. those experiences. Excuse me. Definitely. It's important to note that we don't have a ton of research on um, delayed ejaculation. Delayed ejaculation. No, there's not don't. much. There's not much of a research pattern to it. There's not a lot of uh, um, not a lot of companies that are willing to fund delayed ejaculation um, medication or anything. So unfortunately, we don't have a ton of research on it. And this is kind of what we've got. Where, like you're saying, the mindfulness. Um, is there anything else that you want to touch on when it comes to, um, DE or, um, are we set to kind of move? I'm thinking I want to move more into like the erectile dysfunction and kind of explore some of what that looks like. Yeah. I think the main thing would be just like letting people know, um, that, uh, there are some treatments and medications that they've tried. And if you are experiencing this, um, it'd be really helpful to go see a sex therapist and um, somebody that can help you kind of treat this from an interdisciplinary team approach. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, uh, oftentimes, uh, these guys can go see a pelvic floor physical therapist too. Oh, nice. And uh, they can help with that and make sure everything else is, is going well. Nothing's going on there as far as just muscles um, or pelvic floor dysfunction and yeah. issues. Yeah, having the interdisciplinary approach to it, so it's not just seeing a sex therapist, but really, yeah, getting looking a full... at everything, getting everybody involved, making sure you're not missing anything, um, that nothing medical is going on. Definitely. Well, cool. So, yeah, I think that's it. Huh? Yeah. So erectile dysfunction. Here we go. This is, I think, this is one of my. I guess if we can. I get a lot of this. Yes, me too. <laughs> this is. <laughs> <laughs> this is one I'm really excited to talk about because there's so many myths and there's so much that happens with partners and individuals yeah. and <laughs> yeah. like who it happens to and when, and uh, there's an anxiety cycle that we're going to get into that. I'm just, I'm, I'm really excited to cover this topic with you. So, I mean, identifying erectile dysfunction, I, how do you, when you have clients that come and say, I've got erectile dysfunction, you got to help me, Doc. Mm-hmm. I guess they don't call you Doc. No one called me Doc either. They do, I'm, sometimes. Do they call you Doc? <laughs> sometimes I correct them, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I like the title for a minute. 
<laughs> for just a minute. I do not have, I'm not a doctor. I don't have a PhD. Me neither. <laughs> um, master's was, was as far as I wanted to go. Amen. Um, okay. So, well, one thing I just point out is that, um, and normalize that this is way more common than it's discussed, right? Mm-hmm. This is like, big stigma, right? All around it. Can't talk about, we aren't able to get erections. Erections are like a sign of virility. It's a sign you're a man. Mm -hmm. As soon as you start having an issue, um, it's like, oh no, right? The stuff hits the fan. Yep. The (laughs) stuff hits the fan. Yep. Can't swear on Braxton's podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so I, very first thing I, say, okay, let's talk a little more about it. Tell me what you mean. When did this first happen? Um, really timeline, narrowing it down, right? Mm-hmm. Is, did this happen once, twice? Is that Three times normal? a lady. Right. Four times normal, <laughs> right? Okay. Or is this happening every single time for the last three or four years? So mm-hmm. really narrowing it down to figure out, is this just normal because it's normal for a man at any age to lose an erection. Yeah. Or is this like a, a chronic problem? Definitely. And, and I think... It, oh, go ahead. I think in the DSM, it is one of those that also defines after six months, if I remember correct. I believe it's unable yeah, to I um, achieve... It down. I don't think I wrote it down either. But at the same time, if I remember correct, it is, uh, it is like six, six months, months the majority of the time... Um, like most, most of the time you're unable to achieve an erection, um, or it's very difficult or it takes a lot of time, a lot of those things. And it is something that happens on in almost every sexual experience. So if you're losing an erection and it happens a couple times, even if it's, you know, once a week, um, and you're having sex multiple times a week, um, there's a good chance that you're, I mean, this is not your diagnosis, and there's other things right. that you can experience. I mean, it's worth going to see a therapist and, you know, exploring some of these things. But uh, you are you probably will not be qualifying for a diagnosis of erectile dysfunction. But maybe. Yeah. And I think I saw somewhere 40% of men are heard age 40 and over have or will be affected by it. Wow. Um, so it is something that definitely gets more progressive with age. Um, and men will experience it more. Um, but, uh, it can be for, I think this is why you and I are probably excited to talk about it, but <laughs> there, it can be for so many different reasons, yeah. right? You can have somebody that's having a medical problem that has it, or you have a guy that's fine that can masturbate and has no problem getting an erection, but now he's got a partner mm-hmm. that he has performance anxiety with. I think it's what um, I end up seeing the most. Yes. Yes. Me too. Me too. And I think that is key to kind of note that more often than not, I would say this is treatable because of, well, one, um, I do think a lot of times it's in the, the head um, and it is performance anxiety based, but also we have a lot of good treatment options for it. Yeah. Even as, even as men get older. Whereas we don't, for what we just talked about, delayed ejaculation. We have way more options for this. Well, I think also we start looking at the the medical model of things and the pharmaceutical people have a lot to do with what research is going on into it. All of a sudden, Viagra comes out and it's like, holy cow, we can change erections? Yeah. Let's study that. There's This is a billion-dollar industry. Let's do this. <laughs> right. And all of a sudden, we get all the research. And I think, unfortunately, we don't see very many people that are like, hmm, well, if we have, most people want to last longer dealing with what we're talking about in society. And so there's a lot less research on it of like, is someone going to take a pill in order to um, reach orgasm faster? Mm-hmm. Not as not as many as much as people are saying, I would like to hold and maintain an erection. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a big deal. Um, especially because we live in that world of penis, vagina, intercourse. Right. Mm-hmm. This is like uh, penetrative sex. It's like what birth that. <laughs> Definitely. Most because of what they've been taught. 
All right. So I found the symptoms of the erectile disorder because I just, I really didn't want to leave it being like, maybe. So, <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, we did it for the others. We should do it for the I know, right? So the DSM-5 states that uh, the male erectile disorder um, will manifest at least one of the three symptoms 75 to 100% of the time. So this has to happen in three out of four activities or all activities, all sexual um, intercourse. And it does, ding, six months. Okay, the diagnosis requires persistence of the symptoms for approximately six months. Um, and it is, men will struggle to achieve an erection during sexual activity, or men will struggle to maintain an erection until the completion of sexual activity, or there will be a noticeable decrease in erectile rigidity. So any of those three, three out of four times or every time, um, for six months. I mean, we're talking every single sexual yeah. experience that we're yeah, looking pretty at. Pretty much, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, um, masturbation, intercourse. Yes. Everything. Yep. And so, along those lines, it's that's it's good to know that, and also recognizing that, you know, if you have sex five or six times a week, that is on the higher level, and if you're having sex once a month, um you know, this is going to be depending on how much sexual activity you have as well, uh, depending on what the diagnosis would look like for you. It also reports in there in the DSM-5 is that uh, there's so many other factors that play into it. It's not just, oh, you don't maintain erection while well, you've got uh, erectile dysfunction. They're like, look into what you just said. Is there anxiety? What's the masturbation um, techniques that are being used? Mm -hmm. There's There's a lot that goes into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I think, and I'm sure you see this too. Um, and I, you know, I don't know where you wanted to go with this next, but, um, <laughs> we can just go all over the place. I'm just excited to talk <laughs> right? about this topic. These, these guys come in and they're, you know, like you said, Oh doc, I've got ED. <laughs> <laughs> um, what am I going to do? But they come in and, um, it's really hard for men to talk about. Oh, this yeah. is, this is really, there's a lot of embarrassment around this. So most of the time I find, and I don't know if you found this, but a huge chunk of the men coming in haven't even talked to their physician about it or any mm -hmm. of their, uh, practitioners. And if they have, they're usually, they've tried Viagra or Cialis, which sometimes won't work if it's all performance based. Yeah. I, um, I see more of people, will, but sometimes it won't. Yeah. And I see more of individuals that have gone to their doctor have a PRN or a, an as needed Viagra or something. And they're still like, it's still not helping as it much. Can you help me right. out? Or the doctor or saying, this is all psych. Time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that I get a lot. Um, and, uh, I, for the more medical based problems or age, it does work a lot better because it's, um, a vasodilator, right? Those medications. So it's increasing the blood flow. Yeah. PhD five um, or something like that. Yep. Yep. So they come in and, um, I explain to them the anxiety cycle, right? This happens once and it's like, Oh no. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, okay, well maybe it's just a fluke, right? Something happened that time. And there's a little anxiety there. Then mm -hmm. it happens again. <laughs> yes. Like, oh, no. <laughs> like, bigger, right? Mm -hmm. It's compounding. There's more anxiety. And then we go into the next sexual experience. And then it's like, oh, man, I got to get an erection. I got to be able to get and keep this erection. And at this point, two, three, four times the partner's oftentimes like you're not attracted to me what's wrong mm -hmm. this is my fault right so it starts even more pressure is put on them and more anxiety because now not only are they worried about their level of functioning and they think they're broken or something's wrong but they also don't want to disappoint their partner so now the anxiety is just compounding and compounding and compounding and um Pretty soon, I, you know, tell them it's like the elephant in the room. And they're like, exactly. That's exactly <laughs> what I've been experiencing. Oh, yeah. And um, what I end up seeing with partners, too, is that that um, either they don't talk about it or they do start to, and then they see things in the sense yeah. of, well, okay, he must be he must be looking for, or he must be attracted to someone else, or I must be too fat, or he's he's looked at porn before, and so... He must not be yeah. attracted to my body type and he doesn't like me. And so then they start to experience that same withdraw 
of I don't anxiety. performance mm-hmm. anxiety or I've got to do what those people are doing. And then on top of that, different topic for a different day, but then they start saying, well, it's because of the pornography that um, I've got to be like the girls in porn. And no one's talked about what pornography he's watched or looked at. And so she's got her idea of what pornography is and he's got his idea of what he is looking at. And it just creates another shame and, and anxiety cycle versus oh, being yeah. able to talk about it. No, hey, this is not, it is so common for a man to lose his erection. And this is <laughs> nothing to do with you. Or it yeah, may have I, something to do with you, but not sexually. Not, yeah, don't make it about anything other than what it is. It's the loss of an erection. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's that's an important piece. And I think that's that to say that... Often. Yeah, and especially to say that if that's the first go around, because uh, it could very well be attributed to the the relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, if you guys are having a very difficult relationship, if it's, there's a lot of stress, if there's um, a lot of pressure to perform, or you know the partner saying like, "Why can't you do this? You're, you know, a horrible lover because whatever." Then there's more stress that comes into it. You may be a part of the anxious cycle. Yeah, again, the criticism, the blaming. Mm-hmm. And where I find this comes up a lot, um, I mean, it comes up anyway, but where it really comes up a lot is if couples are trying to conceive. Just like with the delayed ejaculation, like it becomes a really big deal. Really? Um, because if they're trying to conceive, and what is our belief, right? Our belief system is that men should be able to get an erection and keep an erection on the spot. Like mm-hmm. you just better be ready to go. All the time. Um, yeah, that's just how it is. And at 18, oftentimes that is how it is, right? And Your <laughs> body works that way, but still 18-year-olds can still lose an erection from time to time. But mm-hmm. if this is our belief and this is the myth, right? This is like where society is not doing us any favors um, and media is not doing us any favors is... Um, If this is our belief and then that starts to happen and there's so much pressure around conceiving because you've got to hurry, you've got to get it up. It's that time. It's the window, right? We've got to do this every night for seven days or Mm -hmm. whatever. Um, And all of a sudden they can't perform. Yeah. Uh, And then it becomes a really. The performance anxiety. Yes. And now it's not only am I broken and I'm disappointing my partner, but now I can't give you the one thing that you really want. Yeah. Especially focusing on babies. Or that we really want. Or that we really and want. Now, or I'm if there's the infertility problem. things like what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, all that stuff. So partners, I mean, ultimately, what do we say? Partners relax or ask what's going on? I think really they just need to understand that this is normal, normalizing it, and that they don't need to attribute anything that's not there other than it's just a loss of an erection. Right. Yeah. We don't need to add anything else in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then kind of talking about it, right? Open communication again. Yeah. Um, making it normalizing it, making it easy, creating a safe space to discuss that. And then the biggest thing, and you and I talked about this in the uh, PE podcast, but um, doing other things for sex, not letting this just be like, because what usually happens is it's like, okay, we failed. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to go to our opposite sides of the bed, turn over. Nobody's talking anymore. It feels, you know, embarrassing and icky and just like the sexual experience is, is done. Shut yeah. down. And so, um, and so uh, it's being able to do enough um, and continue a sexual experience with doing anything for pleasure, right? Yeah. Oh, Usually definitely. the erection will come back if we can just start continuing to do something else for pleasure and enjoyment. Yeah, especially taking the the pressure off. Yep, it doesn't yeah, like, have to be that. Hey, it's gone. All right, how you know my time like, or yeah. you know whatever <laughs> maybe just kind of make yeah. it into bringing some humor. Yeah, let's do massages. Let's take a hot shower. Let's. Uh, I'll give you oral sex. How about I manual, manually stimulate you? And what I tell men as they get older, um, I say, this is really normal, right? This is yeah. very normal to lose erections. And as men get older, they just need more time spent on them. 
Mm-hmm. Just like the foreplay with a woman, men need that. Yeah. It isn't the 18 year old erection. And as soon as I give them permission to do that, things change. Getting permission. And give, and give their partner permission, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think this that's is how it kind of needs to look now. Definitely. One of, I, I, I like the way that, uh, we're, we've been going kind of through the the lifespan. We got the eighteen year old. Oh, I guess we start out with fourteen year olds that get erections <laughs> yeah. when the wind blows, and then mm-hmm. we've got an eighteen year old that has an erection. And then you know around that age, you're a lot of individuals are starting starting or have been sexually active, and so maybe even have this experience from sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Mm-hmm. Um, but say we get into a, a, a partnered relationship um, or in a religious. Um, situation, you know, we have a lot of um, Christian and, and LDS um, couples that uh, that come in to see us, us being in Utah. Mm-hmm. And what I notice is I get a lot of, and I want to put this in a book or put this out there. I just, I want these new couples that are like, I'm saving myself, my virginity until marriage, and because there's so much buildup. There is so much buildup in the sense of like, okay, in three months I get married. This is what I've been waiting for my whole life. This is so exciting. I wish I, I want them to know that they don't want, they don't have to have sex on their wedding night. Mm-mm. I and, tell them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Not to. <laughs> don't. Yeah. But like build Explore up. each other's Thanks. bodies. <laughs> like actually touch her breasts. You've never touched her breasts. You've never touched a woman's breasts. Mm-hmm. Like just, yeah, explore, kiss. So yeah. really explore the art of kissing and touching and caressing and yeah, doing all of that. First. I love it. Mostly, especially because we start talking, a lot of the times we'd be like, oh man, there's this, you know, women are going to experience pain, which is not true. You, mm-hmm. Well, it doesn't have to be true. That no, is not, you really do not. should never be painless sex. Exactly. Pain sex should never be painful. And it takes women 10 to 45 minutes to get fully aroused in order to have comfortable penetration. Yeah. So they need a lot of foreplay and warming up mm-hmm. too. Definitely. And, and lube. And lube. <laughs> Bring in lube. Good lube. Yeah. And we'll have another <laughs> podcast yeah, about the lube. A whole other <laughs> thing. <laughs> but knowing that there is so much excitement um, for a first time sexual experience, even a first few times of sexual experience. And then I'm speaking in a marriage term, whether it's, you know, gay marriage or, or heterosexual marriage. But in this sense of a married person that has been saving themselves for this relationship or it's in this new relationship and they start to have sex the first time, it's so important to recognize that your brain is one of the biggest parts of your sexuality. And if you were overstimulated or you're just like, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. Or you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have sex tonight. What is that even? I don't even know because I haven't been told or whatever, for whatever reason, there is a huge chance that you lose an erection. And if you feel like you've got to perform or people have been telling you like, Hey, tonight's the night you're going to do it. And all of a sudden you lose an erection we might not go from like, oh, okay, this is all right. We can move on and be like completely into, you know, code red. I now have erectile dysfunction and I'm on my honeymoon and I've got all this. Oh my gosh. And what does my partner think? And it just spirals. Yep. And it starts out the whole relationship, sexual relationship <laughs> on a just bad foot, right? Yeah. And it doesn't have to be that way. It is totally fine at that age to lose an erection. And moving on up, I mean, you've been touching on things of being in a, as a, a male gets older, testosterone changes. Yep, decreases. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and it, which is another reason that it's so important to go rule out medical stuff with this too. And I, I we've done three now, so I don't know, remember which ones we've touched on. But <laughs> um, again... Like, go make sure your testosterone, that they check your testosterone, your free testosterone, um, that uh, they're checking. Uh, and, and this, when an older person comes in, because it's typically I don't see it with a younger person, unless maybe with like type 1 diabetes, but I, I think first cardiovascular, right? How's the cardiovascular system working? Uh-huh. Um, do they have diabetes? Do they have any heart disease, hypertension? Um, is all of this functioning well and could this be a problem? So going to the doctor, ruling all of that out is really important. With Definitely. The dysfunction. And then the other thing I love, I was listening to one of Esther 
Perel's um, sessions that she does with couples Mm -hmm. the other day. And I think I'm trying this now in my practice. Um, It's really important. I think sometimes when we label it, like we're labeling it, Mm -hmm. like as soon as we throw around ED or PE or DE, all of a sudden it's like this name, right? You're the name. It's this big thing rather than just sometimes I don't get an erection here and there. Um, I think there's just so much stigma and negativity related to the word erectile dysfunction that, um, I think it's, I think we can do a better job of getting away from some of those labels and can be helpful. Like, don't let that define you completely. It doesn't have to define you you. are not ED, right? Yeah. And your sex life is not ruled by erectile dysfunction by any means. And if you find yourself like you say, say someone does, um, identify or identify, oh my heavens, that's not the word I wanted to use. Say they do meet the criteria for erectile dysfunction. Um, I mean, what are some, what are some ways that, uh, that you've seen that can help out? Say that they're really one, we've been talking about the anxiety, but maybe it's, maybe it's a little bit more medical related or, um, or we're not quite sure we're in this gap between maybe it's some testosterone. I don't know, but I'd also like to, you know, or I'm, I'm really anxious about it and it's just really hard for me to get on my anxiety cycle. Mm -hmm. So we go through, I do the same thing as I do with PE and delayed ejaculation. Um, we go through like myths of the performance model, right? What did you learn growing up? What did you learn in the media? So one of them, men have to be able to get an erection and keep erection on the spot. They have to be able to last long, right? Have mm-hmm. to have a big penis, whatever our bodies have to look like. Oh, man. Young, yeah. hard, hot. Uh-huh. Uh, penis, vagina, intercourse. And if we're not doing that, we're not having sex. I go through all of this with them and then help them start to shift out of that model to more of a pleasure-based model where sex can be anything. Mm -hmm. right? It can be anything we want, anything that we define as sex for our relationship. And I think I told you in the last podcast, I am a whiteboard junkie. So I use my whiteboard and I have (laughs) this drawn out for them and we draw all over it. Most of the time clients are like, can I take a picture? Um, so they really can kind of see where they fall on the spectrum. And most people are in the performance model. This is like where we are in the United States. Let me start calling you Coach Shannon Hickman. I know, right? <laughs> That's all I imagine is the X's and O's. I'm like, here's you. Here's your penis. Yep. What else are we going to do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so pleasure model, right? There's no expectation. Mm-hmm. The only expectation is that we're doing this for, for pleasure. Definitely. And so uh, one of the techniques I tell them is um, the thoughts are going to come and go, right? Especially if we're in the performance model. Just let them come in. Let them go as fast as they came in. And come back to your five basic senses. Touch, taste, sight, smells, and sounds. And that brings you back into your body. And Mm -hmm. I tell them that with PE too. Great. Uh, And delayed ejaculation. Just just helping you get connected back with your body. I think that comes Uh, up with a lot of men. Especially with the performance anxiety, right? That's Uh been compounding for so long. A huge piece of this is now teaching relaxation techniques, mindfulness, and how to be present. Yeah, because you're so focused on the future. Yeah, because if you're sitting there, I have to get an erection, I have to get an erection, I have to get an erection, Mm -hmm. you're not going to get an erection, right? (laughs) It's the number one erection killer. And same with orgasm. We do that too. Mm -hmm. You know, you're getting frustrated, more and more frustrated. I'm not going to have an orgasm. So most of the time when I start to uh, shift them to the pleasure model and they start to shift to the pleasure model, all of a sudden the erections come back, the... um, orgasms happen, but that's not the focus. That's yeah. not the purpose. I've also heard of, uh, of some therapists prescribing masturbating to a point of you get an erection and then you stop. Not even mm-hmm. to the point of no return or anything. You just, you get an erection and then you watch your penis become flaccid again. And then you masturbate again, you get hard and you watch it go flaccid and you do this back and forth, almost in a sense of like, look, it goes away. It comes back. It works. It goes away. Yep. It comes back. You work. Yep. Yep. Which is a huge piece, right? I'm not broken. I work. I That's work. where sometimes Cialis can be helpful and Viagra 
if it does work for them. And you and I kind of said, you know, depending on how bad the performance anxiety is, sometimes it won't. But if it works for them, that's enough confidence, enough of a confidence boost and builder that um, they can start to realize, oh, I work again mm-hmm. and kind of wean, wean off of it as we're doing sex therapy. Oh, gotcha. As you, um, as you so couple we've it with. done that. Yeah, I've yeah. done that. I, I'm reminded of a, of a couple of the, as we get older into the uh, elderly individuals, I was, um, I've heard a couple of different stories of individuals being up in their seventies mm-hmm. and not having an erection for the past 20 years and ultimately mm-hmm. just ending their sex, their sex life. You know, they'll kiss, you know, he may touch her, things like that. But then his pleasure was completely taken off the table mm-hmm. and it wasn't until they started working with a sex therapist and it was like, oh, well, we can't do this or we do this. And we feel, I mean, even religion being brought into it where it's like, well, if I touch him and it's not with my with my vulva or my vagina, then, um, all you know, th- this is bad. And, mm-hmm. you know, they had to work through what, uh, what their religious principles were. But at the same time, they had their first conversation in over 25 years of what what's okay for us. Or is yeah. it okay if I touch you here? Is it okay if I if I kiss? Is it okay if this, you know, yeah, I feel really good when that happens. And a lot of the times it was coming back to, I mean, he, Viagra and all the other things um, weren't able to work for him because of heart conditions and things along those lines. So mm-hmm. it was just, it was not an option. And that still right. doesn't make you less of a man. And it still doesn't mean that you can't have a sexual experience. Right. It's just, it looks different now. And I think teaching men that you don't have to have an erection to have an orgasm, right? We have um, people that are paralyzed that can have orgasms, people that have disabilities that can have orgasms. So a lot of these men, even though they're not getting a great erection and maybe can't have penis-vagina intercourse anymore or penetrative, you know, sex, they can still have an orgasm. Mm -hmm. And so um, the other thing that I really try to do and work with um, individuals and couples on is, is helping them to um, maybe do like sensate focus, Ooh. which is like a touch exercise, right? To explore each other's bodies. Because I find that for most men, it's so genital centered that they don't have any idea of any other erogenous zones on their body. And oftentimes women don't either. Mm-hmm. So that's a really good way of kind of exploring and learning other uh, pleasure sensors on the body, right? Other erogenous zones that um, might um, that might be useful in helping them. Um, and I think it was in Stephanie's book, maybe it was someone else's book that talked about it. Um, but even just, you know, like the scrotum now touching there or the perineum or other places that there, there might be a lot of pleasure that they've never explored before. Mm-hmm. Prostate glands. Totally. All kinds of places. Face. Yeah, the face. <laughs> Legs, inner thighs, <laughs> butt. <laughs> well, and really just being, yeah, I've everywhere. noticed that, that men really have a hard time with even recognizing what's going on in their bodies besides, you know, what's, uh, what's been okay and what's not. And or what, also, what feels all right. Oftentimes, yes. Yes, and they're also oftentimes so focused on their partner and their partner's pleasure mm-hmm. that um, they have no idea what they like. So Definitely. it's a huge part in discovering what do you like. That's you know, what do you want done? Yeah, completely for pleasure. So, well, um, no, go ahead. I was just say, is there? I'm, I'm curious if there's anything else that uh, that you feel needs to be said about. Uh, erectile dysfunction if you could leave the you know the people that are listening with something about uh, all three it seems like they all merge together is there something that uh, that you would leave yeah, everyone with yeah no no problem i don't know did we touch on what can happen that it can be neurological or physical trauma um it's really funny as we've been talking about this i'm like yes but we've also been talking about that in in the uh, <laughs> i know i can't remember <laughs> Uh, medication induced, right? Uh-huh. ED, diabetes can cause it, or, uh, alcohol, uh, tobacco. Oh yeah. Alcohol um, is a big deal too. Yeah. Getting big. too, getting drunk or using yeah. alcohol really does affect erections. Yes. 
So yeah, if you're drinking and I a lot, guys that didn't know that, and then they stop and they're like, "Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't have that whiskey dick, right? Whiskey That's dick, I think, is what they call it. Yeah. And I think it's important um, to to recognize too when we're talking about drugs is Viagra has side effects and all these other, you know, I won't just say Viagra, but erectile drugs um, have side effects and be yeah. sure to seek, you know, your doctor as well as know that uh, it's not just, oh, this is a magic pill. Yeah. And I think that one of the biggest side effects that I hear, and I don't know what you hear, but is headaches. That's oh. probably the number one. And sometimes like congestion because mm-hmm. of the vasodilator, like sinus congestion. Yeah. Um, and I also think that comes up a lot is, uh, especially within maybe the population that we work with is maybe they've looked at porn four times and now they're stressed because they have ED, right? Yeah. Um, and they think that that's the cause. And so again, we kind of touched on this, but, um, it's really easy to train the body to a certain stimuli and that can be problematic at times, but porn does not necessarily cause ED. Yeah. So, um, again, stopping, like focusing all of your sexual energy on the relationship. Um, there's ways of, of dealing with that too. Totally. So, I think that's it. Just having a really loving partner. Um, and then also, uh, I may have touched on this earlier, but erectile dysfunction, um, can oftentimes lead to PE. Mm-hmm. because guys are so excited that they now have an erection. We <laughs> so have to use it right now really quickly. Yeah. Um, and I really do have, sometimes couples have a hard time getting away from the penis vagina intercourse model mm-hmm. because that's what they've always done. So, it, I mean, this sometimes aren't the easiest changes to make. Yeah, paradigm so be shift. Patient, be loving, be kind with each other. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show, Shannon. This has been very insightful. And I mean, just, I really appreciate you bringing the knowledge that you have into, into the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me anytime. Great. All right. Thank you for listening to Birds and Beasts podcast and we'll see you on the next episode. This has been another episode of the Birds and Bees podcast. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any questions about the show, comments, or questions you would like addressed in another episode, please give us a call at 385-449-1818. Leave your voicemail and your question, or you can also email us at birdsandbeespodcast at gmail.com or visit us online at birdsandbeespodcast.com. 